Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Tea Time with the Jackson Center. I am Kristen McMahon, the president of the Robert H. Jackson Center in Jamestown, New York. With us today, our first ever multi-panel, which I'm very excited about, uh, and we'll be talking about equity and technology with uh, three members of the staff from the Center for Democracy and Technology. So with us today are Avery Gardner, General Counsel and Senior Fellow for Competition, Data and Power, Lydia XZ Brown, Policy Counsel for uh, CDT's Privacy and Data Project, focused on disability rights and algorithmic fairness and justice, which I spell out because that will factor into a lot of our conversation today. And then Hannah Quay de Lavalle, senior technologist with a primary focus on CDT's student privacy project. Hannah, Lydia, and Avery, thank you so very much for having tea with me today. Happy to be here. Avery, I'm gonna have you start off with a brief discussion as to CDT's mission and the work that it's currently doing. Great, thanks, and thanks for having us. This is really fun, and the topic is certainly incredibly important and current, uh, particularly during the pandemic. So CDT was founded about 25 years ago, and we're a think tank based in Washington. We're nonpartisan, and at the center of everything we do is to put the users first when it comes to the internet and the digital economy. So we spend a lot of time working on issues like free expression online, privacy online, government surveillance, competition, and access to the internet itself. And in all of those issues, there are aspects of equity and fairness that have gone under discussed and under addressed over the past 20 plus years. And as we have uh, shifted in recent days to deal with a number of different problems, including the COVID pandemic and the different issues that brings around equity in access, uh, to the president's recent executive order trying to curtail free speech online, over which we sued the uh, president last month, um, to issues that are more emerging, like what does machine learning actually mean and how do we know whether the machines are doing it fairly uh, when it's all black boxed and hard to even see. So we do that by uh, through our presence in Washington, D.C. and also over in Brussels. We have a team that advocates on the Hill and in front of agencies. We also litigate. Um, and a lot of what we try to do is make sure that the people who really understand the guts of the technology are also talking to the people who are making the policy. And so we're thrilled to have people like Hannah who can help us bridge those conversations. I always like to mention that we are funded uh, by a diverse set of groups. We have individual donors, we have foundation donors, and we also do accept corporate support, but that corporate support does not affect any of the policy positions that we take. Um, so yeah, that's and CDT in a nutshell. There. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. So we have an ambitious conversation ahead of us today. Uh, and uh, just given the uh, topic, so I had been billing this as to, we'd be talking about um, some socioeconomic issues with access, some uh, differing ability or disability issues with access, you mentioned coded bias or the algorithmic justice, which is uh, a term I, I recently ran across and really love. So um, we're going to attempt to at least touch all of that in the next 40-ish minutes. Um, and uh, we'll see how far we can get on that. <laughs> so uh, Avery, as you started it, um, the pandemic, um, I think with the closing of the schools, made a lot of access issues kind of front and center again. And certainly uh, education is not the only place where this, these access issues um, arise, but since it's the one that's top of mind, I feel like we should start there um, and talk about, uh, I think it was the FCC's latest report said about 21 million Americans do not have access to high speed internet. Um, I think that works out to about six and a half percent of the, the country. Um, in terms of those numbers, I suspect a lot of people would think that seems awfully small. Um, and, and is that really something we should be worried about? Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna start there. I'm gonna go ahead and say, yeah, it's absolutely something we should be worried about. Um, sure, you could argue it's a small number of people, but it's a small percentage, but it's a huge number of people, right? Um, and, you know, I would argue that kind of divide of access to technology is, is problematic in the best of times, right? As our, you know, economy and increasing parts of our life become more and more online, like that disparity 
is a problem as far as like even how easy is it for you to apply for a loan, right? Like that's harder to do if you can't log on to the internet and do that quickly. So I mean, it's, it's already like a substantial disparity. And then add in the fact that suddenly like access to education is, which is so foundational as far as being able to build the kind of life that you would want is now online, like that disparity becomes pretty much unacceptable, right? Um, you know, and, and schools were sort of put in this position of trying to figure out how to solve that very quickly. Uh, and it, you know, caused them to have to direct a lot of resources and man hours and effort towards doing that when like, really we would rather they have been directing that effort towards actually educating kids. Right, yeah. Yeah. and that makes sense. And um, I think I also read somewhere that the that number, there are a lot of uh, organizations that dispute the FCC's numbers and thinking that the actual number of people without access to the internet is significantly, at least double that number, um, yeah. if not more, because they're, the rural populations tend to be undercounted anyway, since most of the telecom companies self-report their coverage. Yeah, Tristan, can I comment on that quickly? Of course. So there are a couple of things about the FCC's math on how many Americans lack access to high-speed internet that are really important for the debate. The first is the way they define high speed is not the way any of us define high speed. When you're talking about real access to high-speed internet, imagine for a minute that you are two parents working from home with three kids working from home, and you've got five multi-party uh, video conversations going on simultaneously on five different devices. What the FCC defines as high-speed internet is not going to support that without a whole lot of jittering and dropping, as we've all experienced over the last couple of months. So first, their number in terms of how they define high-speed is lousy. Second, their maps are lousy. Um, they allow a provider of broadband services to say they support an entire zip code if they serve one home in the zip code. And that doesn't actually mean serve. That means has the capacity to serve. Doesn't mean they're actually providing broadband service in that area. So when we look at the math on how many households don't have access to high-speed internet, we need to first look at the definition, which is outdated, the maps, which are fundamentally and irredeemably flawed, and even using bad maps with a lousy standard results in tens of millions of Americans not having access. So I, I just would note that um, the number is huge um, and, and that's only one piece of it, right? So that's a, it's a terrible problem and it's only one piece. In order to access the internet, you need not just access, you also need a device. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that this pandemic has brought home for so many families is that they need not just one device, they need a device per child who is studying from home. Um, that's something that if you've got four children, especially if you don't have a whole lot of economic resources, could become a serious, serious problem in terms of your ability to access education. And then the third part of it, which is also important, is you've got to have some know-how, right? Probably everybody watching this chat, I hope everybody watching this chat, knows that you should change your router password from the default password, which is either admin, password, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? But if you are not a tech savvy person, if your job has not required this in the past, you may not know that. You may not know how to secure those devices and your kids access to protect them in the right way. So we need all of the pieces of that to even start the conversation about equity in terms of access uh, when it comes to kids learning from home. And that's before we bring in any of the disability rights issues, which are also very, very difficult here. Well, and it seems so to just piggyback off what you said for uh, the education, I think it was a Pew Research 2018 is sort of the, the Pew Research figure that's sticking in my head that was about one in five students don't have either access to a device that would allow them to connect to the web or some way to connect to the web. Um, and when you think about, you know, 20% of the students in between kindergarten and seniors in high school not having that access, that's that's a significant number of students who, especially in the pandemic, all of a sudden are without access to education. Um, to give you sort of a little bit of a local flavor, we are situated in a more rural county in New York, Chautauqua County. Um, and the, a number of the schools in the Jamestown area where the Jackson Center is located were able to send 
students home with an iPad or something along that line. So if um, they don't have, if they did not have a device at home, the school was trying to augment that in some way. Um, about 30 minutes south of here is uh, Warren County, Pennsylvania. And faced with a similar challenge, they realized they didn't have the resources to do that. So school in Warren County basically stopped in March. Um, and those students went home, um, you know, and there were, there, were some, there were some attempts to do packets and things like that, but certainly even that provides a different access. That's a different way of teaching. And there's still not access to an actual teacher via a vehicle like this. Where, where do we see those gaps in technology the most? This is Lydia. I want to add that when we're speaking about equity and access to technology, this is not an across the board conversation. Everybody is not affected equally or to the same degree. Um, that's true whether we're speaking at the level of who has access theoretically in their geographic area to the internet, as well as who has access to devices that can access the internet. And then for many disabled people who can technically access the internet or may technically have access to a device that can access the internet, but nonetheless can't actually access the vast majority of material that is supposed to be available to anybody who can access the internet. Um, I want to name very specifically when we speak about students, so it's not even just that rural areas are disproportionately adversely affected, but it's students of color, especially Black, Latinx, and Native students. And for Native students, especially Native students who live on reservations, which often don't even have running water because of the complete lack of infrastructure that the United States government has failed to provide in violation of all of its treaties. And when we speak about disability, it's disabled students of color, disabled Black students, disabled Latinx students, disabled Native students. It's disabled students who are living in juvenile prisons who do not have access to internet because prisons and jails do not provide access to internet because it's considered to be a security issue. And yet, this is the direction our society is moving in, one in which, at least for me, as I think about it, the ability to access the internet should become treated like a basic human right, but it isn't. That's not how we've codified it into our regulations. That's not how most people think about internet access. But as we see in the pandemic, not only do you need internet access now to participate in learning opportunities, but you need internet access to file for pandemic unemployment. You need internet access to ask about relief and forbearance from your creditors if you are no longer able to pay for your bills. You need internet access to look up basic public health information about what cases are like in your area, transmission rates, about testing. And the burden of lack of access at all of those levels always falls upon people who are marginalized and especially on people who are multiply marginalized. Now, just turning back to the question of disability and disability access, there's an estimate from the committee that oversees implementation of the WCAG 2.0 guidelines on web accessibility internationally that 98% of all web content fails to meet the guidelines. That's 98%. And I think that's probably a conservative estimate. I suspect that it's substantially higher than that. that because the guidelines don't simply cover access, for example, to screen readers or refreshable brailers that blind people might be using to navigate a particular site or program. They also cover the ability for people to access information by voice control or by using point and click mm -hmm. technology or by using eye tracking technology as opposed to using your hands to be able to do something or to people who have epilepsy that might be photosensitive or to people with intellectual disabilities that affect language and information processing. And um, um, in all of those levels, the vast majority of web content fails, even if it might be accessible in one specific way, it usually fails everything else. And if you're saying that students are supposed to now access their education online, where does that leave even the disabled students whose households might have access to technology and devices capable of accessing the web? That doesn't even solve the problem. Well, it certainly, you know, I think that Lydia, to your point, the pandemic certainly didn't create these problems. It just really brought the starkness to them of, we are not at all prepared, it seems, to live in a society that is this, um, for the vast majority of people to participate 
in a meaningful way in this. If this is how we're going to be living for a period of time, um, and you know, obviously as more and more of our information moves into this format, um, that divide between who can access and who cannot, and, and maybe it's even more than just who can access, but who can access meaningfully um, and not, that wedge gets wider and wider. I, um, you know, it's Lydia, you preempted one of my earlier thoughts too, is that when we're talking about tech equity for people with disabilities, it is, we tend to focus on, I don't, I'm not sure I mean this exactly the way it's coming out, the easily solvable ones. So you see closed captioning, you see ASL interpreters, people sort of think, that's 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 inclusion. That's 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 where this conversation that that covers the majority of people who are going to need um, need access. And I think that the variety of considerations that you listed, um, I will posit that the vast majority of people don't have that in their head when they're thinking about the disabled community and what access for them might look like. So how does CVT direct its energy? for tech equity and the disabled? Where, where are you trying to move the needle? Where are you, where are you talking to people? This is Lydia. We're working on a number of different fronts with people doing academic work, with other civil rights organizations, and with tech policy organizations in a variety of spheres on what it means to promote access, equity, and justice for disabled people. The project that I'm working on focuses specifically on algorithmic fairness and justice, which you mentioned earlier. And what that means is that we're looking at ways in which the use of AI and automated assessments, recommendations, evaluations, or predictive analytics have now affected nearly every aspect of people's lives in the 21st century. And what that looks like in terms of disproportionate and adverse impact on disabled people. So for example, one major area that we look at is the impact of automated assessment in public benefits. When people apply for food stamps or Medicaid, what many people don't realize is that more and more states now use some form of automated assessment to help figure out if you should be eligible at all for the benefit you're applying for, and if you are eligible, how much you should be receiving. And usually that means that you're receiving a benefit in terms of money or in the context of disability related services under Medicaid, how many hours of care you might be approved to receive in order to meet your particular disability related needs. And what we've seen is that in a vast majority of states that have adopted at least semi-automated assessments, large numbers of people who previously have been approved for benefits are suddenly seeing their benefits severely reduced mm -hmm. or completely cut off because of determinations made based on faulty data, based on inclusion of data points or requirements that are outside of what the regulations themselves are supposed to require, based upon uh, badly audited tools and without the use of meaningful human review at any stage in the determination process. Um, um, that similar dynamic plays out when automated assessments are used to make decisions about which people to hire for jobs or about which students to flag for closer monitoring as potential perpetrators of a mass shooting. In all of those contexts, disabled people are much more likely to be surveilled and profiled as fraudulent, burdensome, threatening, or as unstable or inadequate. And what that means is that for us in thinking through how to respond to the harms of automated assessments that do not take into account objectives that benefit disabled people or that try to pursue a just outcome, we have to listen to the people who've been directly affected about what happens when you've been flagged for closer monitoring by a threat assessment team or what happens when suddenly your food stamps are completely cut off with no notice or what happens when you've applied for your 89th job this month and once again your job application went nowhere and you can't prove what happened or what went wrong but you're pretty sure it had something to do with those personality tests that they kept making you take every time you filled out the online application and the fact that you have diagnosed mental health disability um, um, Lydia, if I can break in there, because I think the point you just made 
is a central one to what we try to do um, throughout our project work at CDT. And that is to call for a lot more transparency. So for example, there are now automated content moderators working on some social media platforms that automatically pull down content without any human review. And that is a change because of COVID, right? They had to send their employees home and for security reasons, they weren't able to work from home. So they had to transition more of the content moderation over to AI. Without transparency, it becomes impossible to identify the harms that Lydia was talking about, that, that these are algorithms that are proprietary and confidential. And without the voluntary support of companies to do their own audits and report on them, we are going to have a bigger and bigger and increasing problem. And it's not, it's going to be on the disabled community for sure, but also every other kind of marginalized community. And Hannah, I remember a conversation you and I had a few months ago about how schools use some of these machine learning techniques to try to identify kids who might be in need of additional services, which as I understand it, comes from a great motivation. How do we identify kids who might need support early and provide it before there's an incident, right? Um, but also has some disparate impact issues. Hannah, do you mind if I turn that one to you? Yeah, of course. And, you know, I, I would also highlight um, in, the, in the need for transparency that it's not always clear how these systems actually work, right? Some of them may very well be in algorithm based AI monstrosity. Some of them are just like kind of checklists basically that are still being done by people. Um, and so basically the, the take home of that is that you also have to think about just the data that's going into them as well, right? Because even in situations where there's no sort of digital decision-making engine involved, you still could very well be dealing with, you know, faulty data or data that uh, lacks context is kind of a big one. Um, so CDT actually wrote a, a brief on this about just automated decision systems in education more generally. And, and there's a few use cases we looked at. We did talk, as Lydia mentioned, about um, well, we were particularly looking at a, a social media monitoring aspect of trying to basically identify students, as she said, at, at risk of committing a violent act, right? School shootings is one of those, but also suicide. Um, and again, that comes from a good place, right? Schools feel this incredible pressure to keep their students safe. But if you're monitoring social media, right, that's really hard to do in a like reasonable way. So the kind of canonical example, the sort of one that people like to point to is like, what if you have a keyword filter, right? Just a keyword that like looks for things that say like posts that say gun, right? Okay, what if you have posts that say bomb and then you have a student being like, yeah, that party was the bomb, which no one has said since like 1992, but you get the idea. Um, that like context of that, like the linguistic context, the context of the post isn't necessarily gonna get passed along, right? So maybe what happens is either uh, an actual human being monitoring that fee or an algorithm monitoring that fee just raises a flag that says this person posted something dangerous. And then that context, by the time it actually gets to somebody who's dealing with it is completely stripped away. Um, and so that's where the sort of like, you know, need to engage with these things about how are they gonna be used? What's gonna be the end result of them? Uh, for the person who's actually on the receiving end of that report, what capabilities do they have to either seek out more context uh, to try to understand what actually did happen or to just like throw the report away if they deem it to be unsuitable. Like what are the, what are the sort of pressure valves you need to put on a system like that so that it can still have the human involvement it needs to have to try to direct these things in a meaningful way. Obviously we know that human involvement isn't exactly the like panacea we'd like it to be <laughs> as we're and they'll be all no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it does at least provide some sort of accountability, right? Like another thing that's hard is oftentimes we have this, um, this is sort of like a psychological phenomenon of we, we assume that because a machine said something that it is grounded in fact in a way that we don't necessarily make that assumption if a human says something. Uh, so having, you know, humans does provide a, like almost an accountability metric somewhere to, to, to at least be able to explain like what the heck happened here, right? Which is not always available to us in, in algorithmic systems. Well, and it sounds so from what you, all three of you brought up, it sort of sounds as if there are, well, a multi, multi challenges with, with this. So one is 
um, the average person uh, has no idea what the inputs are into the system to have an understanding of what the outputs might be from that. All they see are the outputs. Um, and then separately, who's actually making the rules about, Hannah, about sort of some of what, and, and Lydia and Avery as well, some of what we've all been discussing is who, who is setting up sort of these frameworks in which that monitoring happens or that evaluation happens or that self-policing or external um, policing occurs and should that be left to the individual organizations should that be something in government should that be an independent agency or watchdog or citizens council or something so how do you how do you what does the shape of the system look like in a way that you think would function the best way possible so I'll is take that, a crack is that at even that a valid one. question? Yeah, no, I'll take a crack at that one because Kristen, I think we're miles away from being ready to answer it. Um, I think that with most people not having thought about this nearly as much as we do because it's our job day in and day out to think about these issues, um, we're not ready to have that conversation at a policy level. And it's one of the big problems. It's one of the things we are trying to bridge. How do we make sure that the people who need to be making these decisions understand what the heck is going on? Um, because every day there is more and more surveillance on all of us. And that's private company surveillance, it's government surveillance, and it's surveillance by you and me and everybody else, right? Um, and so what's being done with that information? How is it being used? Um, I will tell you that I love shopping online and I love when I'm shopping online for one of my kids for a book or for a toy, that there is an algorithm that says, you just bought this, you might wanna buy that because you know what? I am thrilled to get the right Lego that will delight my child. I want that algorithm. I want the wisdom of the crowd that has said, this is the right purchase for you today, You're Avery. breaking my heart right now, Avery. I know I'm breaking your heart, <laughs> but at the same time, it terrifies me because I know that in the future, when we all return to shopping in grocery stores, that some of us are gonna show up at Whole Foods and there's going to be facial recognition at the door and they're gonna know who enters the store. They're gonna know how old you are, what your religion is. They're going to know what your education is and how much money you have, how educated you are. And they're going to push product recommendations to you based on a complicated set of digital decisions that you don't know a darn thing about. Um, and that's going to be very different for somebody in a wealthy neighborhood compared to an underprivileged neighborhood. And as Lydia commented before, it's going to affect people who are multiply marginalized in ways that we don't even begin to understand. So we have said that there are some things you can't use as the basis for decision-making, meaning discrimination in our offline worlds, right? You cannot deny somebody access to a restaurant based on the color of their skin is the most obvious one. Um, but we haven't figured out how to translate that into a digital environment that says we are going to offer you this product or this service based on a set of 67 factors that we collected about you without your awareness. You may have technically consented, but you probably had no idea that to which you were consenting. That was, that's what it would be used for, yes. <laughs> um, and then fed into an algorithm that is a complete black box even to its creators, right? Because the whole point of machine learning is the machine learns. Um, and then spitting out answers on the other side. So I, I want to get to a point where we are ready to have that conversation about who best should make those decisions, private companies, governments, should it be done at the state level, the federal level? How should it vary across countries? Should it be different for children? Should it be different for communities who may need special kinds of protection? But I think we are miles away from that because today most people don't even know that their every activity is being watched and fed into that algorithm. That's fascinating. And that leads me to a question as I was doing some research for things like this. I wondered if these conversations about equity are getting easier because people recognize that they are issues or is there still an awful lot of groundwork that needs to be laid to help people understand uh, you know, how, how something might impact the disabled community or how something, how access might differ depending on 
um, whether you are a straight white man or uh, you know a, a, a blind African American woman, or if you are a transgendered uh, person in a wheelchair, you know as, as you sort of layer on the different parameters, are these conversations getting easier? This is Lydia. I would say that probably contrary to what many people might assume, it's become harder in a lot of ways to talk about equity and justice. And there are many, many reasons for that that I don't necessarily want to belabor because we could spend hours just talking about this alone. But a few that stand out are that number one, more public conversations that speak of justice that speak of social justice in particular, mean that many people who weren't already having those conversations now feel worried about it. They worry that it's just falling into the realm of obsessing about political correctness or what other small slice of the population do we have to remember now? Or that it's gone too far. And I find that reaction to be an incredibly defensive and reductive one that ultimately does nothing to help us advance forward as a society, but it's common and it's out there. And there's another set of reactions that come about where people will think, because I'm having this conversation, I'm attuned to conversations about justice, I'm learning, I care, I support all your causes, whatever, that they then think, oh, we've got this, we have this completely down, we know all these things, maybe we can learn a little more about a couple things here and there, but you know, we're doing the right thing. And what that belies often are some of the most insidious forms of harm. Mm -hmm. When a company or a private nonprofit organization or a school or a government agency or anyone ever starts thinking, because I have a progressive approach, because I support women's causes or I support LGBTQ people or I hung up a Black Lives Matter banner or I once opened the door for someone in a wheelchair, they think that means that I'm doing things right and I can't do things that are harmful. And sometimes it's precisely those types of entities that claim to be working on advocacy for social justice that can be the worst perpetrators of harm, both internally and how they're structured, but also externally and what effect they have on their clients or their customers or the broader community. And so I think all of those complications along with many, many others can muddy the water a lot where we think, oh, it must be so easy for us all to talk about this. And in reality, everyone brings their own baggage. Every company, every organization brings their own baggage. And it becomes harder and harder, especially for people who have more power and privilege and resources to be willing to examine and think about what those power, privilege and resources have granted them and how those powers, privileges and resources affect how they interact with other people to meaningfully engage. And then that burden ends up falling on marginalized people and especially multiply marginalized people to constantly have to be educating, to be doing extra work, to do all the diversity and inclusion and equity work. And nonetheless, to face criticism from literally everyone, from half the world where too angry and demanding and wanna play the victim card. And from the other half of the world where you're, you know, you're just too co-opted or too palatable. If you talk about it at all, it means that you're assimilating too much, that you've given up too much and you've let yourself get co-opted. Um, we're left with no way to win. Well, and that's, so it's, uh, Lydia, I think it feels if you brought up sort of two parts, it feels as if the ability to have the conversation might be increasing, but the, perhaps it's the depth of that conversation and then moving from conversation to actual action or solutions that might also not quite be where, where we Maybe. might not be easy yet either. That's so. Cool. I think that's right, yeah, Kristen. And I, I think another part of the challenge, at, at least for me, is that I don't think we have settled social norms on when we think it's okay to use some of these criteria to make automated decisions. Not all of this is new, right? 16-year-old um, boys pay more for car insurance than 45-year-old women do, right? That is a automated decision based on age and gender, and we've been fine with it since at least the time when I was a 16 year old driver, right? Uh, which has been a few years. Um, we think it's okay to have senior citizen discounts at lots of 
places, right? Again, that is based on age. It's a pricing decision based on age. We offer veterans discounts for lots of people. Children pay less in lots of places uh, to sit in the same movie theater seat that anybody else would sit in. So there are many, many places in our society where we have said it's okay to automate some of the decisions based on immutable factors or mutable factors. Um, and I don't know that we have developed the discourse enough to say when that's okay and potentially even good um, and when it's bad. And I, I look at some of the ideas that are floating around on how do we legislate these issues and how do we do them the right way? There was a legislative proposal uh, last fall, I believe, that didn't get a whole lot of traction. But one of the things it said was that you couldn't use certain kinds of criteria to make advertising decisions for certain kinds of products. Mm -hmm. And the products included education and hiring job employment type sites and credit worthiness um, and housing. I think those were the four. And the criteria that you weren't allowed to use included race and ethnicity, disability status, gender, um, and, a, and a few other categories, which led to some inter interesting conversations around our office about, well, what does that mean for a college that only admits women? Does that mean that that college now can't do advertising that is targeted to women because it's in that protected category of education and it's using one of the characteristics that's prohibited? I don't think that's what the legislators meant when they wrote the legislation. They mean we don't want discrimination that seems unfair to us, but we have not unpacked what does unfair mean. And I'm using the, the simplest models. I think that you know, the, the more technologically savvy in our group here today could probably scare us far more with what happens when it's a whole set of criteria that you can't even really identify. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanna add on to that and kind of note that the result of that the result of not having you know, social norms about what context using that kind of thing is okay, when it's not, what kind of information is okay, what kind of information is not, the sort of like diffuse decision making, right? Like a, this particular grocery store has decided they're cool with a senior citizen discount, right? When you're talking about tech, it's important to remember that tech is still a very homogenous field in a lot of ways, right? So that diffuse decision making is maybe happening like company to company, right? Like each tech company is making its own decisions about which pieces of information it's gonna pull in and you know how it's gonna use those and when and why. And you know, there's some legislation about that that's kind of growing up, but those tech companies are with some exceptions, overwhelmingly white and male. And so the ability to kind of issue spot about like even if you're a very sort of moral upstanding company, your still ability to issue spot is limited by the scope of your context and your experience. And you're not necessarily realizing that actually the address that you live in might actually be a proxy for a whole bunch of other stuff, which you don't notice when you live in a really white neighborhood in Silicon Valley, right? So the fact that we don't have good norms about who makes these decisions and when means that like we should recognize that the default case of that is that tech companies are making them overwhelmingly right now. And we, you know, that does mean that they're getting made by a pretty homogenous slice of the population. Yep. The analogy for me when I was thinking this through reminded me a lot of medical experiments. And so the, the efficacy of drugs, the impact on women or people of color or something like that often, or, and hopefully it's getting a little bit better, but for the, a long time was not really part of the rubric. And so the fact that a drug might have some sort of indication in a woman would surprise the doctors because it didn't have any of those indications in any of the thousands of men that it was tested on. And so this, this conversation sort of, or when I was thinking through what would be the analogy for this, that was sort of the first thing that came to mind because you don't have anybody in that population that you're testing this on or that is involved in, in helping you make your decisions or you have a limited number of people, can't say anybody, not anybody, but you have a limited number of people to, to have a different understanding or different uh, concept of the impact. And with medical experimentation too, this is Lydia again speaking, we have such a long, ugly, and sometimes still continuing history of forcible experimentation on Black women, on Native women, on disabled people, especially disabled people of color, of people in prisons. As recently as this week, 
I encountered public conversation from people openly advocating for testing a potential COVID vaccine on disabled people and people in prisons as wow. expendable and disposable populations. And so I think there, there's really two things to point out there in, in talking about the connections. One is that when research is being done according to ethical protocols, it tends to privilege as research subjects, moneyed, degreed white men as the research subjects. And when research is done without following research protocols that exist for some very good reasons, those who are usually subjected to it and reap none of the benefits are those who are marginalized and who are exploited and abused and sometimes even left to die in the name of furthering research. No, that's interesting. And Lita, you had said something earlier too that um, has been part of uh, something I've been thinking a lot about. And that's, so a couple of weeks ago, I was watching part of the AFI documentary film festival um, and coded the documentary Coded Bias by um, Shalini Kintaya was one of the ones that I tuned into. And that was talking about um, the MIT Media Lab students, um, Joy Bolamini and Deborah Raji and uh, Timnit Gebru, I think. Um, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that, that, that last one correctly. Um, the work that they were doing that basically sort of uncovered this, and I can't imagine it was actually uncovering, but really made them take notice and take their advocacy out to the companies who are working on these algorithms. Um, and the idea of al algorithmic justice as a civil rights issue, I think uh, is a fairly, I don't really mean new concept in terms of it's always been there, but I think it's a newly recognized civil rights issue. Um, and it's, it's everything from manifesting itself in facial recognition um, to uh, cops using it uh, to profile people um, to uh, some of what we were just talking about in the black box of you don't, since we don't know what the inputs are, we don't know exactly how they got to the outputs that they got to. I read an interesting piece a couple of weeks ago that was looking at um, voice activated assistants at home. So your Alexas and your Siri's and your Hey Googles and others. Um, and somebody did a great bit of research and found out that um, those services were very good at recognizing what the words of white men were intending to say. Less good with women and really bad with anybody who was not white uh, in terms of actually even understanding, you know, what is the weather forecast? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure to, to what Hannah was saying earlier that they didn't intend for that to happen. But when you, again, are working with a tech community that is not particularly diverse, it's not shocking that we have some of those outcomes um, that, uh, you know, again, weren't intended, but could really make it difficult for people to be part of the modern economy. And that's not even getting to those who, for whom English is not their first language oh, yeah. or, or things along that line as well. I mean, just another quick horrifying example. Um, I discovered last year as an East Asian person that my face could unlock another East Asian person's phone. Oh, Why did it like? And the phone was supposed to unlock with facial recognition. My face worked on their phone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's you know, we all look exactly the same. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm glad that you said that because I, I was thinking that and I, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was a little reticent to say it. <laughs> I mean, yes, it's, uh, it's, um, it's one of those, um, I, I think at this point, no one is surprised by the fact that bias, and I will say largely, in, probably inadvertently written into the computer code, um, that um, there's, there's so much there's so much emphasis on very clearly the facial recognition side of things and how that can be used and misused. But there are a lot of other places where algorithms show up in our lives. And Avery and Hannah and Lydia, you've all mentioned various aspects of those that because they are less obvious or behind the scenes, people aren't worried about yet. Um, and so this is a little bit of trying to it's almost a three-pronged test of you're trying to build the machine while you're flying it and trying to convince people that it can fly. 
Um, and so it's, it's, it's moving on, just be, it's moving beyond just trying to build it while you're flying it. You also have to use that metaphor. You're then going to crash and burn in a horrible incident that the air traffic controllers are going to throw their hands up and say, well, we're, we're not dealing with this anymore. <laughs> Let, let's check the black box that we've just recovered and <laughs> see if the answers are there. <laughs> All right. I am going to open it up to questions from our audience. Um, this is usually the time when I ask what is in your mugs? Um, just to give people a little bit of time to write questions. So I will start because this was, I did a lot of learning for this, did a lot of reading. Um, and so I am drinking a tea called the Tea of Inquiry, which I find that I gravitate towards whenever I am feeling um, out of my depth. Um, I also didn't really identify a tea in my collection that felt like it went with either democracy or technology. So this was a good, <laughs> this was a good cover. <laughs> well, I'm trying to think what the flavor of democracy is. <laughs> and sour and cold. Ooh, ooh. I was, I was going to go with a little spicy and a little flair and I don't know. We'll see. You should try my tea then because I'm drinking good earth tea, which is oh. a, a, a spicy tea, which is weird but delicious. Delightful. Also has really uh, corny quotes on the little tags on the tea bag. So <laughs> what does your tea quote say on this one? I don't know, I figured out one of them was like that quote that I'm almost certain is misattributed to James Dean about like dream as if you're going to live forever and live as if you're going to die tomorrow or something like that, which is A, maybe misattributed and B, kind of dark. So, <laughs> especially good. now in a pandemic. Yes. Right. Well, in fairness, I bought the tea before the pandemic, so. Whole new meaning. All right. So one of the questions I got um, is from uh, uh, from one of my staff members, um, and she said that she came across the term digital inclusion, um, both policies and officers, and sort of that was a new concept for her. So um, cities and organizations are starting to recognize this and creating actual staff um, to help with these issues. Is this something you all can? talk about? Um, I haven't really encountered that particular term, but if it's sort of the expansion of the CPO, the chief privacy officer role that we've seen, you know, popping up and I'll, I'll highlight a great brief my colleague Elizabeth Laird wrote about like what those are and why in particular schools should have them. Um, I think that that's awesome, right? Like these are complicated issues and it, and one of the things that I think we've sort of been talking around for a long time, and Lydia has brought up things that, that sort of hint at it, is that it can be hard to get buy-in for these kinds of things. So having a person who actually has that as part of their like key responsibility in a way that it's not going to just like fall to the bottom of their priority list and it's going to get forgotten about, like I think that's really valuable. Um, Nicole asked, are there any unexpected challenges or surprises that you have encountered in your work, um, and I yes. <laughs> originally around um, the disability issue with tech equity, but I will open it up a little bit broader. Um, I think one of the challenges. I'm sorry, Hannah. Go ahead. Oh, I just I've had this one like in the back of my head this entire conversation, and I'm going to shoehorn it in here, which is that um, there's also a lot of knock-on effects to both the problems themselves and also trying to fix the problem. So the the they're sort of like second order difficulty. So the one I like to talk about in the school context is like, okay, you have this digital divide problem, you're trying to get kids back online so they can go back to school. So we're going to give everybody a tablet or we're going to give them a mobile hotspot. It's like, that's good. But now they have a school loan tablet in their house. And now you have all of these weird privacy concerns that are very possibly going to fall on like socioeconomic lines. So it's like, you definitely have there's a, an incredible amount of tensions in these space, I would say we're like, fixing one issue, you have to do it in a very careful way if you're going to fix this issue without implicating or raising this issue. And I, I think much of the time you can do that with like substantial consideration and care, but you have to think about the way all of these things intertwine. Sorry. No, your point was much better than mine. Um, mine was much simpler because that's the way I think. And that is that so many of the um, of the pieces of information we need in order to make progress in this space are owned by companies who are not obligated to tell anybody about them. 
So um, many of them do. And I want to give a shout out to all of the tech companies who voluntarily audit their own work and report that publicly. That is a brave thing to do. It is a noble thing to do and is a necessary thing to do. Um, but I think that we are hamstrung in some of our efforts to solve these problems by the lack of a strong fact base that everybody understands and believes in. And so one of the ways I would like to think about solving that beyond encouraging companies to do it themselves, which again is great, many of them do it, keep doing it, do more of it, super, um, is that a lot of these kinds of issues are increasingly becoming part of our government and public benefits world, um, as we talked about earlier, whether that's at schools, whether that's in the provision of benefits, whether that's just in the collection of all kinds of data about us in our day-to-day -day interactions with government. And so I think that part of the solution can be calling on government to think harder about auditing its own processes and data collection and equity implications um, and making that public. Again, that's not an easy sell. Hey, government, tell us about all your screw ups um, is a tough line to try to offer to a politician. But fundamentally, it's our data. It's about us and it's our money being used to process this data. So let's have a call for transparency um, in the private sector, but also in the public sector. Um, and part of that is to solve the problems directly happening in the public sector. Part of it's also to augment our data set, right? Um, if there are ways to use broader data sets that could help us avoid some of these bias issues, that is great. Um, and I think we should be actively looking for places where we can do that. The taking us back to where we began with the education issues related to COVID, that does provide a remarkable study opportunity mm -hmm. to understand how different school districts dealt with these issues and what happened. Did it work? And did it work for everybody in the same ways? Um, I, I think there's a, an incredible benefit for us uh, as a society if we do that work thoughtfully and rigorously and include all of the voices who need to be part of those discussions and debates in answering those questions. Because we are, um, we're building the plane, we're flying the plane, we don't know where it's going, and I really don't want it to crash. I really want it to soar and get us, and get us to the great things that technology promises us all, right? But, um, but there's a lot of work to be done before we get there. Well, one of the things you just said also prompted a question for me is, do you think the government sees the data as our data or sort of once it passes beyond our control, we no longer have any right to it? Do you, do you think that there is some of that that needs to be overcome as well? Yeah, um, so data issues are intense and we could do a whole nother session on that. We could probably do three sessions. But one of the things that we've advocated for for a long time is that people should have access to what's collected about them. And we mean that both publicly and privately um, and the opportunity to correct it because it may be that many of these decisions are being made on the basis of data that just ain't right. Um, and if that's going to affect what happens to you, uh, you ought to have the right to access it and say, that's inaccurate. You gotta fix that. Um, that certainly is an issue that I know is particularly poignant in the disability community and in other marginalized uh, parts of society, right? So people who are transgender are often misidentified in the systems because they had been assigned one gender by the government database prior to their transition um, and then want to change that and don't even have the ability to change gender, right? So There's making sure that people get access and the ability to correct that um, should be an important part of the, of the data rights agenda. I just want to append to that too when speaking about data privacy issues for trans people, there's another layer of civil rights concerns for trans people like me who are non-binary. In order to have our gender accurately recognized or identified in a database also requires us to disclose that we are transgender. Oh. Because there is no one who is non-binary who is not transgender. There are men that are transgender and not transgender. There are women that are transgender and not transgender. So for people who are transgender and of a binary gender, if possible to change data, you can without necessarily outing yourself. But if not, 
then you may be outing yourself because your gender marker does not match the name that's on your paperwork. Or if you're a non-binary person, the only way to recognize your gender accurately also out your status as being transgender. Mm -hmm. And that raises even more privacy implications for trans people that are interfacing with government agencies. Yes, no, absolutely. All right, um, Helena asked a question um, and it says you raised two kinds of technological biases, marketing and access that exist, but she wondered is CDT focused more on directly, for, focused more directly on bias with regard to access or is it the complete panoply of, of, of things? We're gonna fix it all. I like it, yeah. I like, I like an ambitious agenda. We're, we're going to fix it all. I mean, I, I would say it's it's marketing, it's access, um, it's outcomes, it's pricing, it's um, all all of it and more. So yes. Perfect. All right. I am not seeing. Go ahead, Hannah. I was just going to say I appreciate Avery's optimism. It's very. Uh... Someone has to make up for my pessimism. <laughs> It's a nice balance you all have going. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so as I suspected at the beginning of this, I feel as if we scratched, you know, this deep on any of these topics. Um, and so uh, at some point, I would love to unpack some of these deeper too, as, as we've touched on all of these, it seems as if there is quite a wide scope um, to get through. And um, as the Jackson Center uh, Civil Rights, when I started thinking really about algorithmic justice, and I, I love that in the, the documentary I mentioned, Joy Bolomini had has created the Algorithmic Justice League. And I love the idea that there are people running around in capes who are trying to fix all the algorithmic injustices. Um, but you know, I, I am really um, fascinated with this idea of how civil rights is manifesting itself in, in those things that we seem to trust implicitly, as Hannah said, that we, we have this concept that technology is right um, without really having thought much about for most of us, I would say, what's going into what is coming out of that. Um, and so there's, there's, a, there's a lot here that requires um, in-depth discussion and analytics on. So I want to thank the three of you for being with me today. Um, thank you for having tea with me. Uh, next week, we will be talking with David Crane, uh, and he uh, wrote a book that was published late last year called Every Living Thing about his experiences as the founding prosecutor for the uh, military or for the tribunal in Sierra Leone. So we will be talking with David about his book next week and his experiences there. Um, you all know have you we've talked with David once before in this uh, T series. So I hope you will all tune in for that. And Lydia, Hannah, and Avery, thank you very much for being with me today. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you.